Welcome back, everybody, to a little less fear podcast. Today, I would like to introduce Lauren St. George. She's a coach and a consultant. She helps companies and individuals navigate change, overcome big, hairy challenges, and imagine truly creative solutions. Lauren is the founder of What's Next, a one of a kind, highly engaging program that helps people figure out their best next chapter. Often, this need for change is triggered by a major life event or feeling stuck and unsure on what to do next. At the heart of it, we are all looking to live a more fulfilling life, and Lauren has helped hundreds of people find their lives or find theirs. Thanks so much for being on A Little Less Fear podcast, Lauren. So nice to meet you. Thank you. It's great to meet you, too. Thank you so much. So tell us about your journey, Lauren. What got you to where you are at today doing what you're doing today and inspiring the hundreds of people that you've been inspiring? Well, I mean, I think I think it's ultimately a culmination of of life until this this point in time. Um, you know, while I help people come up with with plans on what they want to do next, I think I myself have kind of bounced around a little bit um, and found myself here. But um, you know, I started to um, years ago. I had a creative agency. I've done a lot of work in branding and storytelling, and um, we found a niche working with innovation teams. And through that, I was introduced to design thinking and methodologies that really help you um, to do disruptive thinking. And it led me to getting a master's degree in creativity, which a lot of people think of creativity as the ability to to draw or to paint. Um, But really, creativity is the ability to solve challenges, to come up with new and novel ideas. And so my master's was in that. And in the process of learning the tools and methodologies, I was working with some small businesses. I was working with individuals using the same methods. And I found that they worked equally well for both groups. I then went into the business world and, and, and used those methods and ran, you know, coached um, and consulted with a lot of, a lot of businesses, but then it, it kind of dawned on me that I could be using those, uh, to help people in their individual lives um, in a far more powerful way. I mean, I love working with businesses, don't get me wrong, but oftentimes the fruits of your labor can take months or years before you see things coming into alignment. Um, Products can take a long time to get onto shelves and those sorts of things. But with people, I can see shifts happening much faster. And so it took my mom making the statement after she'd retired early saying, I wish I had retired, I spent more time thinking about what I was retiring to than what I was retiring right. from for it all to kind of come together. And for wow, me to that's say, really powerful to, to, to put in those words. Say that again. That was incredible. It took her some time to realize what she was retiring from rather than retiring, retiring to. Is that what you said? Exactly. Wow. Yeah. And I think we all spend a fair amount of our time thinking more about the past than we do the future um, and planning for the the future. So, yeah, so that's where what's next came from was was really using all that I've learned in the business world, but bringing it to to people to really disrupt their thinking and to help them come up with really what their next chapter should look like. I love how you say that disruptive thinking. Could you elaborate a little more on what you mean by disrupt disruptive thinking? Sure. You know, I think if we keep asking ourselves the same question, we're going to keep getting the same answer. Right. And if we're asking the wrong question, (laughs) we're getting the wrong answers. (laughs) So disruptive thinking is really how do we come at a challenge from different ways? How do we use different parts of our brain? How do we use different sources of of of, uh, of inspiration to really uh, disrupt the thinking, to come up with something that's new and novel? Um, and, and really, you know, solve a challenge um, in a way that that really serves us. And is that was that the basis of what's next? It is. I mean, it's really helping people go from feeling stuck and unsure of what they want to do next to really getting some clarity and 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 a concrete plan to make it happen. Because I really believe people need to leave my program with something tangible in hand that they can go and do. Um, so yeah, that was that 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 methodology and that way of disrupting thinking is is kind of the foundation of what I do. So it's not a typical program. The way we approach things is not typical, um, and I think people have a lot of fun in figuring out you know what they want to do next. How did you come to create such an incredible program? Was this something that you came up with yourself, or did you have a group of people, or was it your own life experience? 
Uh, it's come, it's come from, from my training. It's come from creating something and then, you know, piloting it, trying it out, um, yeah. really, you know, seeing what worked. Um, I think you have to, in what I do in creativity, you, you take on more of a, an innovation mindset, right? So you're, right. you are trying things out. You're learning from what you're doing. You're iterating on that and you're trying to build the best thing possible. So, you know, I think I've gotten it to a really good place, but that doesn't mean that I won't play with some things or change some things out um, because I want to keep making it as good as it can be um, and learning as I go from the people that come through the program, from their experiences, from what they're getting out of it. And if I'm not serving them um, to the best of my ability, then I need to keep, you know, iterating on on what I've created. I love that, Lauren, because I love what you said right now, the innovation mindset and the whole creativity part, because a lot of people, I feel that I've often heard where well, I'm not the creative type or I'm not just as you said earlier, a lot of people will think that creativity means you're an artist of some sort. Mm -hmm. And that's probably what I would have thought of years ago as well. And just the fact that we all have the ability to be creative in our own way, depending on how we want to mold our life is a pretty incredible idea. I love that. We are all creative. We're all born creative. Yeah. It's a natural skill we all have. Right. Um, but like a muscle, it's something that you can strengthen. So, you know, you're using creativity when you open the refrigerator tonight and you try to figure out what you're cooking for dinner. <laughs> that's that's what we consider like little C creativity, but it is. Right. You're, you're it looking is. at those ingredients and you're going, well, oh shoot, what am I, what am I gonna make? Um, and you and you may put something together that you've never cooked before. Uh, that's creativity. Right. Um, and so, you know, that's that's the everyday circumstances of creativity. Now, there's everyday things we can do to just build creativity. Like, yeah, you know, tonight, brush your teeth with the other hand, uh, take a different route to work or to the supermarket. Um, you know, doing those sorts of things gets your brain thinking in new ways. And those are small, simple things you can do. I noticed um, on your on your uh, bio here, I was going to actually ask you some questions. I'd like to know the five simple questions you must answer to transform your life. Now, before we answer these questions, are these questions that came after the innovation part of the trial and error and trying to figure things out? Or is this something that happened right from the beginning of, of creating what's next? Um, you know, these aren't the these aren't exactly the questions we ask in the program, but they they're connected and close enough. Okay. Um, I think these are things that that are uh, a, again follow a, a very sort of logical way of solving a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, and and while they're simple questions, they're not easy to answer because it requires you being uh, vulnerable and honest with yourself when you do them. So. Uh, I, I think they they follow a similar a similar pattern to um, getting from a place of not being sure of what you what you want to do to to being you know having more of a an understanding and a plan. Um, happy to share them with you. Yes, like. please. What are those questions? Those simple questions. Okay, so the, the first question is, where do I want to be three years from now? And the reason why I say three years is because we tend to overestimate what we can accomplish in a year. And we tend to underestimate what we can accomplish in three years. So, you know, three years gives us some time to accomplish things because we have busy lives, right? So right. as you're trying to make change happen or work towards a new goal, I think you, you need to give yourself the time to do that. So, you know, thinking, thinking enough yeah, in the definitely, future. It feels less like there's less pressure when you're giving three years. <laughs> exactly. There's that too. Um, and it gives you time for trial and error because that's so true life happens we try some things right. out and we're like hmm, maybe that's not it so exactly. give yourself some time yeah the next question is why is this important to me that's a, and you know very with, important with, question yeah it's a very important question it's 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 to me it's the most important question because mm -hmm. if you don't understand your why of why you're doing something um you don't have the motivation that you need to get there exactly so yeah, it's a, it's at the heart. You can say what I want to do. You could do the how, the steps of how I'm going to get there. But mm -hmm. if you don't have your why, um, that's critical. That's your purpose. Mm -hmm. It is. The next is whether the obstacles in my way. What obstacles are in my way? What obstacles are in my way? What's going to stop me from getting to that place that I want to be three years from now? 
Now the trick there is to write, you know, write that exhaustive list, but then to actually uh, segment out those things because you're going to have things that are small obstacles, you're going to have things that are more medium-sized, meaty yeah. obstacles, and then you're going to have some huge ones. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you want to look at those those buckets and you're going to go, well, what are the most important things within each of those that I need to solve mm -hmm. in order to move forward? Because you're not going to be able to attack all of them. But what are the most right. important ones? Um, and there may be ones that you're not, you can't move uh, so that you're going to figure out how you got to get around them. Yeah. Those are the big sort of big boulders in your way. I'm sure once you actually start writing it down, it's kind of like you're, it stays in the back of your head and the universe finds its ways to make it all work out for you. It absolutely does. I think it opens, it opens your mind to opportunities. You're going to yeah. see things that you didn't see before. Exactly. You know, it's similar, similar to when you, you decide you're going to buy a, a, a car, you've decided on the make and model. And now all of a sudden everyone's driving one on the road. <laughs> right. It's, it's not that anything changed. It's just, you're now open to seeing those things. So I think if you start okay. to um, not only think about the obstacles, but the next question is how am I going to overcome those obstacles? And that's, oh, wow. that's where you're opening your, your mind to finding solutions to those, those obstacles. Now the, the interesting thing about our brain is it doesn't like unanswered questions. So your subconscious <laughs> is going to continue to work on answering that question sure <laughs> while you're going until you go to sleep. <laughs> mm -hmm. But that, that that spark of inspiration that you might get when you're in the shower, it's not that it just came out of nowhere. Your subconscious has been working on it. So, you know, you start to think about what are the ways that you can overcome those obstacles. Um, and again, you know, you, you can decide, am I going to tackle the small ones first? Because it's kind of low-hanging fruit and I can yeah. I can get some of that out of the way. Or do I want to attack the big, hairy, scary ones? Yeah. Um, because I'll feel more accomplished if sure. I solve those ones first. And what's the fifth question? How do I stay motivated? Oh man, that's a that's a loaded that's, question. It's a loaded question. It is. Um, and for that we can talk tools because because motivation motivation's a hard one. Um it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, because I think one thing is to understand that uh, depending on what your goal is, um Motivation may not be the thing that comes first. It, mm. Action may very well have to be the thing that comes first, which means forcing yourself to do something you don't necessarily want to do. Mm -hmm. So it's so far easier to sit on, on the couch and binge watch something while eating ice cream than to get up and go to the gym. Right. We all have experienced that in our lives. Sure. Um, but that we need to get, we need to do the action. We need to get off the couch and go for a walk. We need to go do something to start to build up momentum and once you start doing it right. you feel better and then you get motivated and then you do more action and it becomes this kind of cyclical thing but so how do you how do you force yourself to get off the couch yeah um well you do you do a variety of things one is you, the very first thing you do is you find something that's going to take you less than two minutes to accomplish it might be you know it might be uh google search where the closest gym is that's it. You just know where it is. Yeah. Because the next day it might be go online and, and get membership. So literally, literally quite be, literally baby steps, baby steps, simple steps. If I want to learn yoga, well, maybe I have to go buy a yoga mat first, right. you know, but what are the small things you can do? Because what you want to do is start to see some momentum and you want to follow, be able to follow through on what you say you're going to do because you want to build trust with yourself because if you set yourself up for, for a goal mm -hmm, you set yourself up for a goal and you you don't make it or you give up along the way you don't you learn to not trust yourself so oh true. i want to do that oh, i'm not going to follow through so why even bother right that's incredible so how does i mean i'm my mind's going a million miles a minute right now i'm <laughs> thinking all kinds of things here but the uh, the first thing that I wanted to ask you is, what is the greatest challenge that you have with your clients out of these five or just in general? What is the greatest challenge that you feel that you get out of the majority of your clients? Mindset. The mindset. Mind mindset is the biggest one. Meaning um, changing their mindset or sticking to a specific mindset? Overcoming fear. Overcoming Over fear oh tends goodness. to be the biggest one. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. moving out of your comfort zone requires going into your fear zone in order to, in order to move through and, 
into, um, you know, there's a framework I like, which is comfort zone, uh, fear, learning, and growth. So you have to move through those in order to get to that, that growth. Um, and so, yeah, we, we can stay on the couch. We're what were those zones again, Lauren? Much. You said comfort so zone? Comfort zone, fear, uh -huh. learning, learning, and then growth. And then growth. So, so basically getting people out of their comfort zone to face their fears and then learn from the fear or, mm -hmm. and then from there, that's where the growth happens. And that's where the can, growth happens. then you can start going into your questions. I'm assuming your five mm -hmm. questions, your guidelines. So what, what is, what are people's greatest fears that you're noticing or that you have noticed that you've come across? I mean, the ones that I tend, tend to find are, there's a fear of failure. Mm -hmm. It's a big one. Um, and that, that comes from a variety of places. It could be that we tried things as children and, and we failed and we were embarrassed or someone made fun of us. We've taken that forward with us. So we're, we're less likely to try new things to put ourselves out there because we're, we're scared of, of what may come back. So false um, beliefs. False beliefs. We've been trained into it through school. The school system has yeah. expected to get the right answer the first time. So we don't have that innovation mindset of, let me try, let me iterate, you know, let me keep going and I'll, I'll get there. I mean, mm -hmm. most products that are on the shelf didn't get there the first, the, with the first iteration. And exactly. Dyson talks about the 500 right. uh, prototypes they had before it got out there. And, and we somehow expect ourselves to get it right the first time. The first time. So that's, that's, so that fear of failure is a big one. Um, change is fear of change is a big one. Um, our, our brains are, are designed to help keep us safe. Mm -hmm. And when we try to break out of that comfort zone, we're breaking the patterns, we're breaking the comfort the, and, and we're breaking out of that sort of automatic autopilot, uh, way of living. Mm -hmm. Uh, and our brain goes, Ooh, no, that's scary. Right. So we enter this kind of fight or flight mode where, uh, we're not being chased by woolly mammoths anymore, but uh, you know, ideas and change and new uh, new things can seem threatening. So when you hear that voice in your head going, "Oh, that's that's I can't do that," or "That's not a good idea," or that's usually your brain trying to protect you from doing something that it perceives as being you know scary. So how can we make change comfortable? I don't think you can. I think I think you can do things to try and. Uh, soften it maybe mm -hmm. I think having a plan helps you to at least take it step by step mm -hmm. um, I think understanding your why so that you keep your motivation up helps you to keep pushing forward um, because I think if you don't if you don't want it badly enough you're not going to do it so I think understanding your why is fundamental to that but sometimes we just got to get uncomfortable yeah right. and that's where the growth happens right that's exactly. it's getting out of that comfort zone I find that I guess sometimes the biggest fear is like actually taking that very first minute step. It's like, sometimes I will sit on something for a couple of days. Like, why am I taking so long? Why not just do this? Why not just send mm -hmm. that email? Why not just record that video? Um, and I can imagine this is true for many people. What, how, what can help for people to break that fear of the very first step, even if it's a baby step? Uh, you know, it could be things like making sure you have the right support group around you. Um, you know, make you've got your 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 people that you confide in that they can hold you up, right? When you when you're afraid of taking that first step, um, I think accountability. You know, if you put it out there, um, you know, again, you're building trust with yourself. I'm, I'm going to follow through, I'm putting it out there into the world that this is the thing I'm going to do. Now, I think you need to be careful on <laughs> who you're telling, because again, you don't want people to to kill an idea before you get it out of the gates. But um, but accountability in some way, shape, or form, uh, I think helps with that. And like I said, I think the, finding the smallest, easiest step that you can take and then reward yourself for taking it. Reward yourself along the way as you're working towards your goal and don't back off of that. Set that goal, that you know, that first small step, the next small step and reward yourself. Um, and then the final one is just have compassion, I think, because, because we are going to have setbacks. Mm -hmm. We aren't going to get it right the first time. Um, we are going to have days where we don't want to, you know, get off the couch, like have compassion for yourself when you, when you do have a setback, um, and don't use that setback as, as a reason to just ditch the whole thing, but to get up and try again. 
uh, before we, we before you were talking about having compassion for yourself, you said to reward yourself. What's a good way mm-hmm. to reward yourself? It could be big. It could be small. I mean, I think that's up to every single person. It it, it could be uh, I'm you know anything from I'm going to go and see a movie to I'm going to get a massage to I'm going to spend time with my my family. It's whatever those things are that 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 make you feel good, um, and that maybe you don't do enough of that it feels rewarding to do it that makes sense and as far as having compassion for yourself um sometimes i find that that's actually difficult for me like how can i how does one have compassion for themselves and how do they actually take time to be compassionate for themselves is that downtime is that reading a book is that saying i'm not going to do anything today or i understand that i'm feeling uh, overburdened by this i mean what how do you define that it's a great question. Um, I think it comes from from loving yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, we often will will give compassion to other people, but not right. ourselves. Right. Um, I saw something online the other day that said, you know, make a make a list of all you know of all the things you love, uh, and at the end of it, it said, I bet you didn't put yourself on the list. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's yeah, they so said, powerful. That is so powerful. That 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 one hit hard for me. Um, yeah, I think I think you have to have if you have compassion for yourself, you have to love yourself, right? Absolutely. Wow, that's that's really incredible to think about. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's the most challenging thing that you find about your program? Oh, the most challenging thing. I think the most challenging, but yet the most fun thing for me is, is that everyone is different, right? So even, even though they're each person is coming in and they may even have a similar challenge, what we're bringing to it is a lifetime of experience and setbacks and just who we are as humans. Mm -hmm. So even though I'm running a program that, you know, has a, a framework that I run the same every time or largely the same every time, the variable and the, and the challenging pieces that each human being is different and what they bring to uh, the conversation is different. So that's the most challenging part for me. Sounds rewarding as well. It is. It absolutely is. Yeah. And it sounds it like is. it would help you as well grow in different ways. Definitely it has. I mean, the conversations that we have uh, are just as, you know, just as mind opening for me as, as they are for the people in the group, because again, everyone's coming at it from a different perspective. Um, and that's the beauty of, of running it as a, as a group program, because people are coming in with different experiences and expertise and skills. And so they can lend that to each other, uh, which makes it a far more enriching experience for everyone. And what's like the age that you're, what's the average age that you're currently helping? Because I'm wondering, like, as you're talking about this, I'm also feeling that even teenagers could benefit from programs like this, especially with like a a cool title, like what's next. I feel like even (laughs) young kids could be like, hey, I want to know what's next. I want to be with what's next. (laughs) Um, You know, typically the people that find me tend to be 35 plus. Uh, but I have I've certainly run the program with with younger people. I think the the youngest so far has been 26. Um, I, I and I've run it all the way up to I think 80 82. <laughs> so wow, we all have we all have these pivotal moments in our life where we wonder what's next. Um, and they you know they often are uh, you know career based or it could be I've just gone through a divorce. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm an empty nester. I want to think about my right. retirement and what that looks like. Mm. Um, I'm trying to find more fulfillment can happen at any point in someone's life. Um, so yeah, it's, I've run it with a, a wide array of people from from various generations. And, and I can also imagine it, you probably help people that are grieving as well. Um, I have some, yeah, n- not as many, I think, because I think there's a, for grief, there is a period of time where you probably need to be spending time with a therapist, right? You need to be talking True. about, uh, you need to be talking through the emotional part. Um, okay. But when you're ready to start looking towards the future, of course, yes, of course. Yes, definitely. So most of the, most of the things that you're handling here are like divorce, uh, empty nester, retirement, things like that. Yeah, I mean, a good still, I would say about 50% of it is still career. I mean, because for a lot of people, financial is is right. is a major component, right? It to, really is. Mm-hmm. 
So, but it's it's run it's run the gamut over the years. And what's changed over the years? Like, let's say over the last five years, how how have people's goals and purpose of life changed compared to how it was when you first started? Because I know that there's constant change going on, either with social media or with new ideas or because of creativity. How have you seen this evolve? So I I did start this program about two years ago. So it's it's relatively new in that in that side of things. I think, but what I think we have seen is. Um, while we have these pivotal moments in our life, sure. um, and and we all have a variety of them, mm-hmm. uh, we've just obviously um, had a major global um, challenge that we've all gone through at the same time with the right. pandemic, mm-hmm. and so the great resignation uh, and 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 what has come out of that, the the time that people sat at home reflecting on on life has definitely I think had an impact on on wanting to ask that question of what's next and oh yeah it really has it has yeah so that's definitely um timing wise (laughs) I'm probably at the right time for 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 a lot of people yeah I feel that you are at the right time especially because the pandemic I feel actually allowed people to really go inward and try to and ask these five questions that you that you have right here and that's because of the downtime that they had and mm-hmm. probably living true people really looking for their inner true life purpose rather than doing things for other people. They, I, I feel that people are expanding to really find their own, their own niche and their own creativity and their own talent. Yeah, I would agree. I'd agree. Um, we all were faced with, with something that was ambiguous in terms of when, when was the end going to come? And it hasn't come. People have, you know, gone back to living their lives, but it's not to say yeah. that the COVID's gone away. Um, but we all were faced with this not knowing of of when things would end. When could I go back to living my life again? Um, and and it does make us reflect on: Is this really the way that I want to be living my life? And with the the death toll that we did see, um, right. yeah, I think it was a wake up call for a lot of people in terms of: Is this really is this what I want to be doing for the rest of my life? Lauren, so what are ways that people can live a more fulfilling, full of life, life? (laughs) So, you know, when we talk about fulfillment and purpose, a lot of people equate that to what they do for a living. Um, And I I think it's far beyond that. Um, So fulfillment, fulfillment, you know, I've heard the, the, the framework of it's a, it's a three-legged stool. And certainly if one of those legs is off, the, the, the whole thing's out of balance. Um, but I think the first leg of that stool is uh, engaged uh, engagement. Do we feel engaged in something in our life? And that can mm-hmm. be work, but it could be hobbies. It could be a variety of things. But do you have something that you wake up thinking about in the morning that you want to do? You know, that thing that you, that gives you, uh, you know, that sense of flow when you're doing it time you forget about time and right. you're really engaged in something um, the other is self-care are we doing things that uh, are for ourselves um, or you know are we giving ourselves the time that we need and then there could be small things or, or big things but um, are, are we are we doing self-care and the third is are we giving back in some way and it doesn't have to mean am I financially you know, giving to charities or am I volunteering, but do you feel like you're giving back in some way? And if you can, if you have things that fall into those three areas, you're more likely to feel like you have a fulfilling life than, than if one of those is off. And so you're, but you're saying that that's a little different than life purpose. Oh, you know, purpose and fulfillment and happiness. And we, we do throw these words around. I, I, yeah. I don't think that people should go out and look for their purpose. I think you, you, you look for the things that, that make you feel happy, which tend to make you, you know, feel fulfilled at some point. Right. And then along the way, you're like, wow, that thing, that thing that I have been engaged in, those things that I love doing, actually, that's where my purpose lies. Right. So I, 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 when we have these conversations within my within my groups, I, I, I am reluctant to say go find your purpose to anyone. Um, right. I think your purpose makes kind sense. of finds you. That totally makes sense. So if you have joy when you're doing something and there's happiness and 
and the time is just going by, that's that's a really clear indicator of what you what more of what you need to be doing. Mm -hmm. As long as it's healthy, right? <laughs> as, long, as long as it's it's not detrimental to you or the right. people around you. Yeah, then, then I think you're at least, again, you're you're kind of finding your path, you're on the right track. Um, that these are the things that make me, make that I get joy from, that, that make me happy, which then will, I think leads to fulfillment and fulfillment along the way, you'll say, that, you know, this is probably my purpose. That definitely makes sense. And what's next? How long is this a program? Is it a one-time workshop? Is it a, like a one week, two weeks, three months? It's a six week, it's a six week program. Okay. It's pretty intensive. Um, but you know, when do we actually give ourselves permission to, to really put a concentrated period of time to thinking about sure. ourselves? So yeah, it's six weeks. Um, it's definitely, you know, it's a time commitment of, um, we do two calls a week. Uh, and then there is some, there is some sort of homework outside of that. So it's definitely a commitment for six weeks, but mm -hmm. it is my commitment to the people that, that, that go through the program and are part of a cohort that, that they're going to leave with something very tangible that that's going to really get them on their path to, to their what's next. And you do this in person or through zoom or both? We do it at this point, we do it remotely. Um, so yes. that allows me to work with people, you know, across right now mostly north america but that, that i'm absolutely open to to other to time zones we just have to make it work for everyone but um i've certainly i've done i've done once off uh workshops with people from you know as far as new zealand to here but when it's a consistent six-week program yeah you know, i try to make that work for everyone um so we do it remotely uh to allow for for time zones um and certainly it was something i had to learn at the beginning of the pandemic was how to go from in-person workshops to remote. So I think I think we've got we've got that covered pretty well at this point in terms nice. of the experience that people got, can go through um, remotely. But my long term my long term dream is to is to do it as a in-person like one week uh, oh, on a beach really somewhere. Nice. Oh exotic. my goodness, that sounds amazing! Yeah, let's let's have fun. Let's let's go somewhere fun and do it. So right. that would be that'll be something for the future. Well, I'm sure you'll do it. And it's already there for you, Lauren. You're already gonna you're already there. <laughs> so the six week program it, it has two calls a week. And what what are these calls? Is this is that what do you have homework? You say you give them homework. And so is there like a video? I mean, what what do they follow? What are they supposed to follow every day for six weeks? So uh, um, we typically do a Monday and a Thursday call. The Monday call sets mm -hmm. you up for the week. It's off. We we talk about what the focus of the week is. What you know. What what we're going to come out with at the end of it. Um, we talk about the sort of activities that people will will do on their own time, uh -huh. um, so that everyone's clear on that. Um, I always record those calls and make them available to people if they were to miss, um, or certainly for them to go back to. They, then typically it's one to two hours a week of their own time. However, I have had people who've thrown themselves in and spent way more time on certain things than others. So it's really what speaks to you and areas where maybe you want to dig in a little deeper. Our Thursday call is not that people have to be done by Thursday with, with their homework, but really have started enough that we can have a conversation about the progress you're making. Have you hit any roadblocks? Do we need to talk about mindset things? Um, you know, and an opportunity to share back with the group because the more you're prepared to share with the group, and that's up to everyone what they what they share, but the more you you are prepared to share with the group, the better they're going to be as a sounding board for you. Um, and the better the ideas are that are going to come out and the people are going to give to you. So Thursday is really about talking about progress and overcoming obstacles and that. um and we do do some work on those calls as well. I, I I'm trying to maximize our time together. Mm -hmm. They're about they're they're ninety minutes, which I found to be a good period of time. And the groups are small. I I usually run them four to seven people, um, so that it is more intimate. Um, and people come away after six weeks with you know with a community that they can tap into anytime they want to because now you've got you've got a group of people who really know you <laughs> and can be there as a sounding board anytime you need it. Are these calls actual phone calls or are they Zoom calls where the four they're to Zoom seven calls. people? Oh, nice. There's Zoom calls. It's important to see each other, I you know, as, yeah, as much as you can. Mm -hmm. And what type of assignments are you giving uh, your clients during the week? These are questions to ask themselves, like a journal that they have to kind of just be working at towards or? There's a workbook. So there'll be different, there'll be different activities, um, answering different questions. Um, yeah, they, they, they vary. Um, 
the first week is really about helping people sort of reacquaint themselves with themselves. Uh, along the way, you know, life has a way of of uh, sidetracking us, um, which is not a bad thing, but we have family commitments and we have job commitments right. and we have commitments to our loved ones um, and friends and whatever, and, and we'll take on obligations and things and we'll forget along the way, I think sometimes mm-hmm. about the things we're passionate about or that we really care about. So it's, it's, there's a, uh, that's the first week is about really kind of reacquainting yourself with what's important to you um, and who you are, what are your values and wh- mm-hmm. where, where are your strengths? What are the things you, you just don't want to do, right? It's not yeah. where, you know, as, as, as we get older, I think it's, it is more about, you know, finding the right path and letting some things go. Um, the second week is about, getting clarity um, on what your big question is. Um, again, back to if you ask the wrong question, you're going to get the wrong answers. Wrong so answer, we, yeah. we spend a fair amount of time figuring out um, what's our, you know, what's our why and, and what's the big question. Um, and then that's the question we're going to spend the next four weeks answering. Uh, week three is a big brainstorming. Everyone is helping everyone with ideas. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, we really push for the big wild ideas because you can always rain an idea in it's hard harder to make it big so we we have a lot of fun with that from there it's about really looking at those ideas that you have um and we go for quantity so that you can kind of weed through them and see what's what are the things that maybe you hadn't thought of before how can things go together what new thinking does it trigger for you because it may th- you may think of some other things you had you hadn't thought of, True. and then we go through the process of whittling down those ideas to what really resonates for you, what's connecting to what's important to you, um, and criteria that we set during week one, uh, and then week six is all about putting the plan together. I have you know templates to help people really think through what are the next steps, immediate next steps that I have to do, what are the things I need to go and work out next. For a lot of people, it could be. A, I need to go and speak to my financial advisor to see if this actually is viable, or I need to speak to an accountant or a lawyer because now I've decided I'm starting a business. So now I've got to, I've got to actually speak to, to someone about that. But we put together the plan that allows people to go and take those, those next steps. I love this, Lauren. You know, I wrote down your steps and as I was writing them down, I was really feeling it being, I mean, you really broke it down to find a good, easy way to get some clarity. It's almost as if um, just breaking it down weekly the way that you did as far as what are your values and getting clarity and then brainstorming. It allows the individual to sit down with themselves and to really give themselves that space to think these things that otherwise they wouldn't be doing on their own. So that's really important. It's really beautiful the way you've done this. Thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. So how can our viewers or watchers and our listeners get a hold of your program if they want to be one of your clients and how can they get a hold of you? So my website is answerwhatsnext.com. Uh, you can get a hold of me through there. Uh, you can also start to, uh, you know, you'll you'll be able to uh, sign up for my newsletter if you're interested. Uh, that's a weekly newsletter where you can every week it's a, a new area to think about tips and tools and things um, to help people stay motivated and and um, uh, and live the life that they want to live. So that's that's a, a, a free resource for anyone who's interested. Um, but yeah, through my website, you can book a call directly with me if you if you want to learn more, if you want to speak to me in person. That's amazing. Lauren St. George, thank you for being on a Little Less Fear podcast. I have one more question for you, Lauren. Knowing what you know now, if you can go back to a time when life was a little darker, what would you tell your your past self? knowing what you know now, having the tools that you now have? Uh, a little darker. Um, I don't, you know, there's a, uh, there's a, a lyric from a Florence. Uh, and, and the machine. And the machine that I really love, which is always darkest before the dawn. Um, <laughs> and I think, I think when things get dark, it's re- recognizing that they're not always going to be dark. Um, so true. Mm-hmm. So that that's in my darker times has kind of helped me through. Um, the other is gratitude. I, it's not, you know, I think some people think of it as, as woo woo, but there's more than enough science to prove that gratitude can make you more optimistic. It can make you happier. It can help you really, you know, be, be more present and able to attack the, the things that you want to, to reach those goals. Um, so 
practicing gratitude uh, is probably been one of the things that has most fundamentally changed my life over the last few years. I love how you said that. Gratitude helps you become present, which is so true. Mm-hmm. I'm very grateful to have had you here on A Little Less Fear podcast and you sharing your incredible wisdom light with the world. It was very nice to meet you, Lauren St. George, and I hope you have a blessed day and good luck with your incredible program and all your amazing clients that are benefiting from this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.